Hi, everyone. Today, uh, we are joined by Nicolas. Hi, Nicolas. Hello. Uh, where are you calling us from and what do you do? I'm basically uh, in Geneva, Switzerland. Sunny uh, Geneva today. And I'm both uh, an associate at the Near Future Laboratory, a design fiction consultancy, and associate professor at the Geneva School of Art and Design. Amazing. I hear that you have just uh, published and um, written and published a book. There's a book only in French, though, about smartphones. Uh, that is basically my, uh, my PhD thesis in uh, anthropology about how people use their smartphone, the meaning they put in this uh, object. Yeah. Amazing. I'm going to be ordering it because I read French, but uh, you've got an English book coming up soon as well. Yeah, yeah, there's uh, an English book about uh, what I call doctor smartphones, uh, the smartphone repair shops, and how people build a certain kind of uh, skill sets, repairing phones, repairing, uh, adjusting uh, phones and repairing them, recon reconditioning them for, uh, for users. And uh, I'm kind of interested in how this is a sort of a place of social innovation as a sort of counterpoint to the Silicon Valley. Amazing. And that, uh, when will that come out? Uh, obviously, it's not ready yet, but I think uh, this fall, probably October or November. Uh, and it's going to be, I mean, as, as usual, with the type of thing that I'm doing, the physical copy will be, uh, you have to pay for it, but the, the, um, the digital version will be free and open access. That's uh, quite important for me. Amazing. Uh, so you've brought us three objects today. What is your first object? All right, so uh, first object, and it's kind of heavy to uh, have it like this. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this thing. It's, uh, I mean, it's kind of a French icon in, uh, in design and technology. It's, uh, it's a Minitel. It's basically the sort of the ancestor or sort of mix between a telephone and a computer, an object that is, I mean, you can, lift it like this, but you're not supposed to, it's not a portable machine, it's something you left, uh, you had to leave at home near the telephone. And it's, uh, and it's sort of the ancestor to, um, I mean, the, uh, well, the computer, uh, the networked computers that uh, we have uh, nowadays, an object that I personally, as a, as a teenager and as a kid in the 80s and the 90s, I, I used to, well, uh, have fun online to uh, meet people, to access uh, Jap Japanese anime and manga and role playing games, and obviously download uh, video games as well. But also, I mean, do administrative stuff like like uh, registering to like school or uh, some kind of uh, bureaucratic <laughs> forms where I, I had to use these things. So for me, it's kind of an important object because it sort of uh, frame my experience as a, as a person interested in technologies. I had one when I was a kid as well, except it was the, um, it was like dad's thing. So it was next to the phone line, which was in the living room next to the um, television. And I never touched it. It was just yeah. a box that did some things, but I didn't know what it was. So I don't know if there's a massive age difference between you and I, cause I was born in 1980. Um, but it really didn't feature. It was just the, the object. Um, and yeah. I find that super interesting that even within a short period of time, uh, an object can go from an object that just sits there to something you are using and you're engaging with. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I was born in 77, uh, so I, I used it around like, like probably between 11 and, and, and 14. And it's obviously the, the object was very... I mean, it was mostly used for like very utilitarian uh, uh, uses, and and there were kind of sub communities of of people ex exchanging uh, information, tips about where to find, as I said, some Japanese anime, or some sub communities about interested in video games or role playing games, and it's th those were not very well known. So you had to. Uh, know some people who could give you the, the code. Uh, you, there was no URL at the time. You had to type 36, uh, 15, and the name of the, the, ser the server, basically, where you, you could uh, find people. And, uh, and this was, I mean, th this was kind of important to me uh, in, in the type of work that I'm doing now because it, it was my, I mean, probably my first experience of, of having what was called 
boîte aux lettres, uh, BAL, like the, it's, it's basically the, the email and there were forums. There, the, the forums sometimes were called walls, like, like Facebook walls uh, later on. And it's, it's, it, it was my first experience of what it means to interact socially online and also uh, to understand that there were, it was not just the technology, there were people behind that, people who could uh, be, uh, could be administrators for new ser servers. They were called system administrators, sysadmin, and, and there were people designing services on this, this technology. So, I, I mean, I remember realizing that this was not just an object that would just work independently with some, some kind of magical algorithm, but there were people uh, pulling the strings or taking some some very sound design decisions between one server and another. So, yeah, I think it, it, retrospectively it was it, it was it, it was kind of intriguing, and I, and I, there are friends that I met with this this technology uh, that I still have uh, nowadays, and I have contacts on Twitter that, I mean, those were contacts for the Minitel era. So that I think is makes this object quite quite important to me. Amazing. What is your second object? So second object in this uh, tiny box is um, and it's gently wrapped in this kind of bubble wrap plastic thing is uh, this pin that says, I have seen the future, uh, General Motors Futurama. And this was the, um, the, the sort of uh, pin you could get when you visited the Futurama, uh, sort of a, uh, a big building in, um, in uh, New York in uh, 1939. Uh, it was, it was uh, produced by General Motors, the American car company, and, and, and commissioned by, by them and made by a designer called uh, Norman Belgedis. And you would get this spin after visiting the, the pavilion for the World uh, Expo, uh, as if you saw the future. And in, inside the pavilion, you could see the city of the future, uh, a city uh, like uh, some kind of representation of New York with plenty of cars and skyscrapers that was basically how General Motors wanted to project themselves in the in the future, and 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 I, the reason why I, I quite like this this artifact is because and it's probably I mean I bought it recently it's not like something that I had from the past it's not family heirloom uh, at all but the reason I have it is that I'm I'm interested in uh, foresight uh, futures research uh, the way people in different societies build some kind of representation about the future and how designers, uh, like engineers, marketing people, uh, or anyone can, can try to project this kind of vision about the future. So my, the anthropologist in me is interested in all those so, sort of traces of those speculations about the future in the past. And obviously I'm not, I mean, I don't own a car. I'm not super happy with the kind of uh, city of the future that existed in this pavilion. But I do think it's, it was a very important uh, step in the history of design and the history of, of uh, modernity and, and technology as a, well, as an illustration of, of, of what it meant to, uh, well, as, as a group of people, as a society, to try to influence people in paving the way for like scenarios about the future year 2000 and, and stuff like that. And given that we are at the time, I mean, the, the, the time we're in is, I mean, we, we, we also do that, but it's kind of tricky because it feels like we're in sort of like permanent present and it's difficult to find alternative uh, vision about the future that like derives from the, I mean, the everyday life, the everyday capitalist kind of uh, system. I do think it's interesting to look back and, and see how things like that played a role in the way we shaped our understanding about time, the passing of time and the future. Um, do you also think that there's something about uh, sort of post-crisis, because obviously it's the end, uh, or actually it's the beginning of the Second World War, so there's a sort of, I guess, a feeling of a crisis coming on, and therefore a feeling that an image has to start to be prepared for a, a longer-term future in order to get through the crisis, so that you know, you might be sent to war. And I think in 39, it was arguable whether the US was gonna get involved in the Second World War at all anyway. But you might be called up to war, uh, but there'll be a car waiting for you when you come back. So there's yeah. a, you know, there's sort of, um, something is there to save you after the difficult bit. Yeah, 
And I would say it was not just the car, but science and technology. And, and I, I take this, this, this like sort of souvenir of the, the future of the past, a sort of a yesterday's tomorrow as a, as a sort of souvenir of a moment in time where like it was before like all the drama of the Second World War, the Shoah and the, and, and the atomic bomb. And like five years before the bomb, we, there were some big message about technology that is going to like be the, the way for, for the future. And, and the, the whole Second World War sure that it shows that it's much more, much more complicated uh, than that. But regardless of that comment, yes, it's, uh, uh, it's interesting nowadays because we're in a moment of crisis and we need to find some kind of like vision or set of visions. There's not just one, it's always plural that, that, I mean that we all have to 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 find, and I don't think there's any equivalent to uh, to this at, at at this point in time, uh, mostly because this was commissioned by a, like a, a car company. But I do think that probably there's this kind of sentiment or perspective in uh, well uh, with a lot of people that we we have to to like create our own future, and the one the present we have is definitely not satisfying. It makes me. Um, um recall all the way back in March uh, when there was a, a global hack day for uh, against COVID and it's very interesting to see what came out of that particular hack day. Um, let's move on to your last object. What is it? Yeah, last object is much, uh, much more pragmatic. It's a, it's a knife made by a French company called Opinel. Uh, and it's made in uh, in Savoie, in the, the Alpine parts of uh, of France. So it's my, uh, it's uh, I mean, I, I used to have one, but I, of course I I lost it. So I I bought one a few years ago, and it's the type of thing that I always uh, carry when I go to the mountains. And it's very efficient for various things like eating cheese to uh, cutting ropes and and leaves and, and stuff like that and it's all, also the, the type of thing that I always forget in my bag and when you're I don't know say in Paris or uh, you want to go in the museum and, and there's some of course it makes some noises at the entrance and, and some people uh, ask you to leave this kind of thing because you're not supposed to carry a knife and, and I'm definitely not the kind of masculinist macho guy who really wants to have his knife uh, with him but I, I do think it's when you're uh, uh, outdoors it's, it's important to, uh, to have this kind of object and one of the reason I, I wanted to show it here beyond like the fact that uh, I'm not always uh, next to a computer. I'm also uh, uh, an outdoor uh, guy. Beyond that, I mean, it's uh, it's also related with a, a side project of mine that I've been pursuing in the last, uh, probably in the last five years or so, uh, about the Alps. And and uh, I'm interested in the Alps as a as a sort of a territory and as a as a place to understand new visions about the future and new vision about our relationship with technology. Uh, most of the work about technology and futures is done in cities. And I realized that li living in Geneva, uh, that close to the Alps, it's, there's a good uh, opportunity to, to, to think about a different territory. Uh, that's one reason. And a different reason is that Geneva is, um, I mean, it's not, very well known, but it was a very important place in the history of science uh, and, and technology because of uh, modernity, because of some scientific research happening here in physics, in geology, but also in, uh, in the realm of imaginary worlds. And, and the fact that Mary Shelley wrote uh, Frankenstein in uh, Geneva uh, 200 uh, years ago in Geneva and also in the Alps, uh, because she went around and, and used that kind of uh, backdrop for uh, uh, Frankenstein makes it for me as a sort of an interesting entry point to to observe the role of technology uh, in, in the Alps. So I'm, I'm interested, it's not just knives, but I'm interested in all the different uh, um, hydroelectric uh, systems in the mountains, uh, the way uh, people uh, uh, use mobility uh, systems uh, in the Alps, the way uh, 
I mean, if you go to the Swiss uh, mountains, you could find uh, all the uh, uh, military uh, bunkers. Uh, you could, I visited a, a place that used to be a gold mine and now it's a Bitcoin uh, farming uh, facility. Uh, next to the Opinel um, uh, factory, you have um, uh, a wind farm, wind turbine, sorry, to, to test different uh, technologies. So I'm, I'm interested in taking this sort of uh, I mean, it's, it's not the usual place you, you think about technology and, and, and observe what kind of relationship people build with that uh, in, in those uh, mountains. And, and for me, it's, it's like, uh, you, you know, there's this whole trend in science fiction called solar punk about uh, trying to understand how new kind of energies like solar energy might uh, help us reinvent uh, scenarios about the future, reinvent alternative and counterpoints to cyberpunk. So it's, it's, I would say it's a bit close, although I'm not using the term uh, solarpunk. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm just doing like the uh, anthropologist slash uh, design fiction uh, producer, uh, spending time in this context and working on this kind of literary uh, book that I'm doing about the Alps. And the next, the next phase would be to design a sort of participative design fiction uh, in the in the shape of a a role playing game uh, manual like we use the the old school uh, Dungeons and Dragons role playing game manuals, but to help people in the Chamonix uh, Valley envision their future with climate change, with problems of biodiversity, with heavy pollutions between of uh, traffic between France and uh, and Italy, and that's. Yeah, that's basically what it is. Some kind of fun uh, side project that started with a knife outdoor in the mountains and now it's turning into some kind of uh, curious uh, endeavor. That's amazing. I think it's also really interesting to, uh, you know, you have this return to the, uh, to, uh, the countryside, which is a very uh, important, I think, classic image that we have of a lot of very famous design schools and very famous mm -hmm. design movements. So I think you're, you're right there with all of them. Um, yeah. Where can people find you, Nicola, on the web if they're interested in your work? Uh, that's basically my website, nicolasnova.net. Uh, I have a Twitter uh, account, Nicola Nova, uh, as well. And you can also find some material on the Near Future Laboratory website. Uh, we just released a, a COVID-19 uh, fanzine with my colleagues from the Near Future Laboratory. It's, uh, you can find it at nearfuturelaboratory.com. Uh, Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us Thanks. today. And I hope everyone's enjoyed.